Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, we're going to play a short video concerning the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Thank you for all of those who have given. You know that on your bulletin it says that children and the youth are not going to meet tonight. Change that. They are going to meet tonight at 6 o'clock. Children and the youth downstairs in the discipleship time. And let's pray and we'll watch this video. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come together for worship. And we pray, God, that you will just continue to move towards Christmas Day. Keep us in the center of your will. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are Jason and Rob and Eli, your IND missionaries to a part of Thailand called Isan, where we serve as a part of the growing church planning team, along with several other missionaries. We are currently in language study and building friendships with the purpose of sharing the good news of Jesus with the people of Isan. Because of your giving, we had the opportunity this December to share the meaning of Christmas. We did that in Christmas celebrations in different villages and communities all around us. During those celebrations, the love of Christ was shared, the gospel was shared, and relationships were strengthened. Please pray with us for the seven new believers who accepted Christ during these Christmas celebrations. Thank you for giving to the cooperative program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. It is truly making a difference in people's lives, both here and in eternity. Joel Stan. We'll sing our opening song. You know, when I was picking these songs the other day, I told my wife, I said, I'd never, I don't know how many times I've sang this song throughout my life, but when you read those first lines, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive your king. Let every heart prepare him room. And that line, and let all heaven and nature sing. Like you wish you wrote something like that. That's what it's going to be soon because. Joy to the world Yeah. 
worship. We're in the book of Isaiah. We're reading Isaiah's Christmas card. This Christmas, he's primarily the Christmas prophet. Isaiah tells us more about Christmas than any other of the prophets. Now, he doesn't tell us everything. If you want to find out where Jesus is going to be born, you can't find that in Isaiah. You've got to go someplace else in the Old Testament. The book of Micah to find that out. So when you read the Old Testament, you've got to remember, some people it's kind of boring at times, or monotonous, or teaches. But it's all pointing to this thing we call Christmas, the Lord sending us a Savior. Isaiah has taught us that Christmas is all about life. The Bible says that we need life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we talked about that. Last week we looked at the fact that Christmas is not only about life, but it's about light. There's a darkness in this world, a darkness of sin, a darkness of Satan. And Jesus came to be the light of the world. John 8, 12, he said, I'm the light of the world. He that walks with me shall be in uh, the light and shall not walk in the darkness. We talked about that a little bit last time. And this morning in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, we have this passage that reminds us that Christmas is all about love. This is primarily the passage we think about when we think about Christmas in Isaiah. Is this great Christological passage about Christmas. Let's read these two verses together. I'm reading from the King James Version this morning. You enjoy it whatever version you might have this morning. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon the kingdom, to order it, establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Love. Christmas is all about love. Sometimes you'll see on a card or hear a song that love came down at Christmas or something like that, something poetic something symbolic, and something very true and accurate. And when we look at these two verses, and we'll look at some other verses in the New Testament here in just a minute, we see God's love embodied through Jesus Christ in two ways. The person, that's who he is, his identity, and the work, that's what he's done, his ministry. And when you're studying theology, you study the doctrine of Christ, Christology. And that's basically the person and the work, who he is and what he's done. So we see that here. Notice, first of all, verse 6, the, the person of Jesus, and we see this in two ways in verse 6. First of all, his nature. Unto us, that's everybody, unto us. He's for us. He's the gift of God to us. He's for us. He says, unto us a child is born. Now that's his humanity. Jesus was born. Now, God could have sent his son as a full-grown man. He could have sent him in many different forms, but he sent him as a baby in a manger that he may grow and experience all the things that we experience in life. Remember from the life of Jesus, sometimes he was tired. Sometimes he was hungry. But he walked on water. He cast out demons. There's a great mystery to that. But the fact that a child is born speaks of his humanity. He's like us. But then notice also, unto us, again, us, all of us, a son is given. And that speaks of his deity. He's the son of God. And we'll see in greater detail in just a minute. So he's all man and he's all God all the time. The most unique person who's ever lived. Jesus Christ, two natures dwelling in one person. He had to be a man to identify with us. He had to be God to suffer for our sins and to give us life. Only one person could have done that. Why did he do it? Love. That's why. That's what love does. 
Love submits, love surrenders, love sacrifices to the will of the Father. That's what love does. That's always the response of love. When we receive love, we respond in that way. That's how we know. And so we see his, his nature, but we also see his name. Look here at verse 6 with me. Now, Isaiah includes about 30 names or titles of Jesus. And uh, Paul said it this way in Philippians. He's the name above every other name. <laughs> so there's lots of names in the Bible given to describe this matchless name. Uh, Peter said in Acts 4.12, there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. We're saved by the name of Jesus, which is indicative of his nature and the fact that God sent his son to love us and to give his life on the cross for our sin. Notice he's called there the, the wonderful counselor. That speaks of the plan of God. God sent his son to, to be the savior for sinners. He's called the mighty God. That speaks of his power. It's one thing to have a plan, but it's another thing to have the power to enact that plan. Of course, we know that's a resurrection power. For after he died on the cross from our sins, we know he rose from the grave the third day to validate and prove that he is who he says he was. And then the everlasting Father, that speaks of his purpose. Remember in John's Gospel, he said, I've come to reveal the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus, and you'll see what God is like. Part of God's plan and his purpose was to let us know who he is so that we could have a relationship with him. And then, of course, the last title there, the Prince of Peace. We think about that also on Christmas card. Then suddenly there was with the angel the multitude of the heavenly host glorifying God and saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill to men. God coming to us, whom the Bible says are at enmity with God, enemies of God, against God, and yet God coming to us and saying, I love you, and I want us to be at peace with one another. I want you to know that I'm for you. I'm your God. And to bring us into that family relationship. So we see his person there in verse 6, who he is, his name, his nature. And then in verse 7, we see his work. His ministry. Uh, and verse 6, I left part out. Look at verse 6 again with me. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, his kingdom, his rule, his reign, says it shall be upon his shoulders. Of course, what does that speak of? Speaks of the cross. Carried the cross on his shoulders. He hung on the cross and the wooden splinters on his shoulders. He bore our sins with the world on his shoulders, the sin of the world on his shoulders, the weight of the world on his shoulders. Why? Love. That's why. That's why. You've heard me say this before. It was our sin that put him there, but it was his love that kept him there until he said it was finished. So we see his government. He was born to die for our sins. And then in uh, verse 7, it says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So not only lived, was born to die, but he died to live. He has an endless kingdom, the throne of David upon his kingdom. From henceforth, it says, forever and forever. So it's an endless kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom. And then it says he's not only born to die, that's part of his work, and died to live, that's part of his work, but he lives to love. Look at verse 7. It says, of the increase of his government, he shall order it, he shall establish it. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so he, in the person of the Holy Spirit, lives within each believer. The spirit of life, the spirit of light, the spirit of love. And so he's got a kingdom of love. So who he is, his person, what he does, it's all about love. All about love. Now, the word we most commonly use to describe this indescribable love of God is the word unconditional. You'll often hear preachers and teachers and read books about the unconditional love of God. And the word unconditional 
means about what the word love does anymore in our culture. We don't understand. You know, we throw the word love around like, you know, I love the St. Louis Cardinals and, and I love my dog and I love grandma and I love to go fishing. We just kind of wear love out, you know, by using it in many different ways. You know, I love my honey, I love my baby, I love biscuits with my gravy. You know, we just kind of throw it out there. And the word unconditional is kind of like that too. We don't really understand biblically what God's love is. So turn with me to John's gospel. And John is going to help us understand, with Isaiah's permission, um, what this love of Christmas is all about. This so-called unconditional love. Now you can turn to John chapter 3. That's our memory verse this week, John 3, 16. We'll start there. That's a good place to start. If you remember John, John's called the Apostle of Love. And John was even so seemingly, arrogantly, willing to call himself the disciple Jesus loved in this gospel. Almost sounded like John saying, Jesus liked me the best. <laughs> but it's not like that at all. It's the fact that John was the first one who really understood the unconditional love of God. And he tells us about it in John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation. You read John's five books and you find this love of God mentioned over 100 times. John talks more about the love of God than any other subject in his writings, and he talks about the love of God more than any other person in the Bible. So let's look at this John 3.16. It's one of these kind of things we think we know all about it, but I don't know if we do. Uh, we read it, we think, we hear love, we say love, but do we love? Do we really understand that Christmas is about love? John says, God so loved the world. Now that's unconditional. God loved everybody. He loved the whole world. That's the people in the world. But unconditional doesn't mean what you think it means, or most people. Most people today that I talk to, they think unconditional love means this. Jesus died on the cross, therefore God loves everybody and everybody's going to go to heaven. It's not like that. Yeah. Well, of course, they don't mean everybody. There's a few people they would leave out. You know, the Democrats would leave out Trump, and the Republicans would leave out Biden. You know, we've got lists of people we wouldn't put in heaven. <laughs> but most people think because God is good and God is love, and he is. God's unconditional love just means everybody gets into heaven somehow, some way. But keep reading. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, here it is, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So here's the thing. God's love is only unconditional because Jesus met the conditions Amen. at the cross. Somebody has to pay <coughs> your, my our sin debt. We have sinned. We have broken God's law. We have no relationship with him. Somebody's got to bridge the gap. Somebody's got to save our lives. Somebody's got to keep us out of hell. Somebody's got to get us into heaven. Who's that somebody? That's Jesus. Amen. Christmas is about that. So God's love is unconditional in its offer. He offers love to everybody. Look, whosoever. Write your name in there. That's you and me. That's anyone and everyone, Republican and Democrat. <laughs> and all the critters in between. <clears throat> but it says, whosoever believes, that's not anyone and everyone. So God's unconditional love, the love of Christmas, he offers it to everyone. But we must decide to accept his offer of love by repenting of our sins and trusting Jesus as the Savior who came, not just to be born in a manger, 
and to die on a cross and to rise from the grave to show us that life is ours, that light is ours, that love is ours. So, turn to John 13. How can we know? How can we know for sure that we truly believe? Jesus fulfilled the conditions to provide God's love. But what do we do to know that we truly accepted, that we truly believed? When he died, he earned our salvation. But what is the evidence that we truly receive? Because I talk to people almost every week say, I believe in God. But you look at how they live, you don't see much evidence. Some people think, well, I got baptized when I was a baby at the Catholic Church or some other church. That means I'm okay, right, preacher? As I live any way I want to. Some people call themselves Christian, but their morals are not very Christian. How do we know? Uh, is there some way that we can tangibly say, yes, I have truly believed in Jesus Christ. I have truly accepted the love of God. Not just some idea or concept or understanding that God loves me, and so I'm okay. I can do what I want because he loves me. John answers that question too. Are you there, John 13? Remember, Bible students, John 13 through 19 happens in less than 24 hours. John goes into painstaking detail of the last words of Jesus Christ before he goes to the cross to show us God's love. To demonstrate, as Paul said in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't say, if you could be good enough, I'll give you a Savior. God didn't say, if you get baptized, I'll give you a Savior. God didn't say, if you keep the Ten Commandments, I'll give you a Savior. God didn't say, if you're a church member, I'll give you a Savior. God didn't say, if you tithe, I'll keep you, give you a Savior. <laughs> he said, when you're at your worst, I'll give you a Savior. That's what Christmas is all about. And so Jesus came, and John talks about his last words here. In the upper room, John 13 through 19. Now, all of Jesus' words, of course, are crucial for us. But last words take on a special significance, not only for Jesus, but for anyone. And so in John 13, 34, and 35, what did he say? A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. So, truly receiving the love of Christmas, Christ's unconditional offer, available because he met the conditions, he paid for our sin, he took our sin upon him. I killed Jesus and you helped me do it. Our sin put him on the cross. We're guilty, but he took our penalty. He's our substitute. He's our sacrifice. He's our Savior. So, truly believing in him, truly receiving him, will always be evidenced by replicating him, repeating his love. Notice what he says, verse 35. By this shall all men know you're my disciples. That's what makes the difference in the Christian, as opposed to the church member, in name only, or the good moral person who's nice, but who doesn't know God, or the person who's trying to be religious, and do more good than bad and hope that it'll work out one day? No. When we truly have accepted the unconditional love of God, which is unconditional because he met the conditions, we will love like he loves. That's the evidence. That's the proof. Let me show you with these own words. Keep reading. John 14. Watch this. I don't have to tell you. I'll let him tell you. John 14, 15. If you love me, 
keep my commandments. We call that obedience. If you love me, Jesus said, if you truly love me, if you truly accepted me, if you really understand what Christmas is all about, then do what I say, as I say. Uh, verse 21, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father. I love him and will manifest myself to him. Verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, we will come to him, make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keeps not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Turn over to chapter 15. Verse 9. John 15, 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. Keep on loving like I love. That's the evidence that you've got my love. Can't give what you don't have. And then verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. And even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. There's many, many, many more verses I could read, but that's evidence enough. And yet so many people think, if I just go to church, or if I just do the best I can, or I'm better than I used to be, or better than somebody I like to compare myself to, that I'm, I'm doing okay. But the Bible says that person who has truly received the love of Christ will evidence they've received the love of Christ by loving like Christ in ever increasing measures. Let's look at an example of that. Keep on turning. John 21. This is a very familiar story. John 21. The story tells us that Jesus has appeared now for the third time to his disciples. He died on the cross, loving us unconditionally. That is, if you accept me, I love you. If you reject me, I love you. But if you accept me, there'll be a difference in your life. You won't just be concerned about going to church or saying I'm a member of such and such church or I'm doing better. You will love. You will have a desire to love others with the unconditional love that I have given you. That's the evidence that we truly receive God's love. Christmas time. So verse 14 says it's third time he showed himself to his disciples. So it's three times. And this is that wonderful um, episode in the life of Simon Peter. You remember this. Verse 15, when they dined, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, do you love me? There's the question. That's always the question. That's the question at Christmas time and any other time. The Lord is always asking us, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's a love thing. And Peter said, well, you know, Lord, I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. Verse 16, Simon, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And he said to him the third time, verse 17, Simon, do you love me? And he was grieved. Because he said the third time, do you love me? And he said, you know all things, you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. Now, if you look back at verse 1, you see that Peter wasn't in the right position when the Lord showed up. He'd gone back to fishing. That's what Peter liked. That's what he was comfortable with. That's what he was confident in. And even though Jesus had died on the cross and rose from the grave, and he'd seen him twice, he still decided he was going to go back and do what he wanted to do. Simon Peter wasn't interested in being a pastor. He wasn't interested in feeding sheep. He was competent with fishing for fish. So Jesus had to come to Simon like he sometimes has to come to us and ask us the love question. You see, in life, we sort of get off track sometimes. We know up here it's all about love, that we ought to love people, people close to us, people far from us, people in our family, people that we work with. We're supposed to love. We're supposed to demonstrate the love of Christ. We're supposed to be different as Christians. But we sort of get off track. We sort of get on a treadmill. We get in a rut. 
We go to church when we feel like it. We read the Bible when we feel like it. We pray when we need to. We sometimes give. We sometimes feel convicted about sin. But over time, we're not very loving. We become very critical and very judgmental. We become very difficult to deepen relationships with other people. And so sometimes Jesus will show up in our lives and he'll say, do you really love me? And we say, well, Lord, you know I love you. <laughs> and he'll tell us to do something. Will we obey? If we love, we will. It's a love thing. And that's what Peter was experiencing here. I know there's different words used here. If you've got one of those study Bibles, it'll tell you all the different words for love and all that kind of thing. But when you, when you clear all that theology out, it's basically about, Peter, do you love me enough to love other people by doing what I say? See, some people will say they're going to have Christmas and they love everybody, but they won't forgive. They won't talk to so-and-so. They don't want to see such-and-such. Such. That's not love. So we make all kinds of religious excuses and we'll come up with all kinds of religious activities and we never love. And Christmas is all about love. And the proof that I've truly received the love of Christ is that I love Others. Jesus said there in John 13, By this shall all men know you're my disciples. Now back at this time, every rabbi had his disciples. Rabbi so-and-so, rabbi such-and-such, and rabbi what's his name? And each of those disciples would be known by some sort of distinctive. We still have that today. I think we call it denominations. <laughs> or abominations, or whatever you want to call it. But one rabbi, his followers, would be known by their doctrinal distinctives, what they believed and what they didn't believe. Others would be known by their dress, what they wore, what kind of garb, you know, how short their skirts were, or what, whatever the deal was. A another would be known by their diet, what they would eat or what they wouldn't eat, how kosher they were, or how right they were with the Old Testament law of Moses. Every rabbi had certain distinctives that people plugged into. Jesus said, my disciples will not be known by their doctrinal distinctives, although those, those are important, or their dress, that's important, modesty and all that type of stuff, or their diet, that's good for your body. He said, my disciples will be known by their love. That's it. And so that's what marks the believer. Now turn to 1 John, and we're almost done. Not wore John out this morning. <laughs> We're going from Big John to Little John here. From the Gospel of John to the First Epistle of John. All I want to do this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, is remind us that it's all about love. Christmas is about the love of God. The unconditional love that God showed us that once we receive creates conditions in us that we must love as evidence of the fact that we've accepted his love. And if I'm not loving like he loved, there's a problem. There's a problem. It could be I've never received his love. I just thought I did. Or I just believed in my church membership or my good works and my good behavior. Or it could be that I have accepted his love but I got off track. And I'm just sort of going through the motions without much emotion. And Jesus at Christmas wants to remind us, if you love me, you'll do what I say, as I say. Because that's what love does. I love Allison. She asks me to do anything, it's not hard for me because I love her. When you love somebody, it's not hard. It really isn't. When you love people, it's not difficult, even when they're difficult. And sometimes they are. So, 1 John. Now, John is writing. Look at 1 John 4, 7. 1 John 4, 7. Look what he says. Beloved. <laughs> Beloved. He's talking to people who have accepted the love of God. We would call them Christians today of many different denominational spots and stripes, different camps and tribes. But those who have truly accepted the fact that they're sinners, and they need a Savior. And Jesus is the Savior every sinner needs. And they've repented. 
And they've accepted that unconditional love of which he met the conditions that create conditions in us that we must fulfill to prove that we've accepted the unconditional love. <laughs> so he calls them to be loving. Don't they know they should love? Don't they understand love? Aren't they loving? Read on. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone that loveth is born of God. There he is. And knows God. There he is. He that loves not knoweth not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us. Because God said, who? His only begotten son. There's John 3, 16. His only begotten son. Into the world unconditionally for everybody that we might live through him. That is, he loved us so we could love. That's the evidence that I've truly accepted Christ as my Savior. Now, verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation. Now there's a, a great word. Uh, you may have a newer verse that says atoning sacrifice or something like that. What that means is the wrath of God was poured out on him at the cross. He absorbed all the hell, all the shame, all the guilt, all the penalty that was intended for us due to our sin nature. He took all that for us. That's the good news of the gospel. He became the propitiation for our sin. That's why he cried on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For in that moment, he experienced all the loss so that we could experience all this love. He became the propitiation for our sins, not just the best of us, and not just the rest of us, all of us. Every last single one of us. Beloved, if God loved us like that, so loved, for God so loved the world, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. One of the love odds. Look at the chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Love ought. That's where Peter was. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Here's what you ought to do, Peter. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Here's what you need to do, Peter. <coughs> Peter, do you love me? Read. He asked me again. Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Yeah, I know all things, Peter. Here's what you need to be doing. <laughs> Not out here fishing and doing your own thing, but submitting, <coughs> surrendering, sacrificing your life for others. 1 John 4.12 says, No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. You get better at loving by loving. That's the way it works. And so Christmas, Isaiah, Christmas, John, Christmas, the whole Bible, Two questions as we conclude. Two questions. Number one, have you received the love of God through Jesus Christ? Have you received the gift of God's love? That's number one. You either have or you haven't. Okay? I didn't ask you if you were a church member or you've been baptized or anything like that. But have you received, can you go back to a time in your life when you truly know you received, you believed, but did you receive the gift of God's love? That's the first question. 
Everything begins there. If you ever watch any of those old Billy Graham crusades, I love to watch them. Billy will always emphasize this. You may have been this, and you may have done that, and you may have this, and you may have that. He acknowledges that we have lots of religious experiences, and they're good. But then he'll say, but do you know for sure? Are you sure? Do you want to know for sure? And so that's the second question. How do you know if you truly receive the love of God? Well, I've answered that for you this morning. You're loving. And if you're not loving as you should, you need to come to Jesus and say, Lord, my heart, help me. Show me, teach me what I need to do to demonstrate the love of Christ at Christmas. Have you received him? And are you sure? Father, this message is what it's all about. Everything else about Christmas, the religious aspect, the secular aspect, the cultural aspects, everything else that we do, and a lot of it's wonderful, a lot of it's good, a lot of it has value. But none of it really matters if on the other side of the Christmas thing we don't love like Jesus loved. Help us, Father. Search our hearts this Christmas and make sure we've received the gift, the ultimate gift, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, the gift of God's love. And then help us, Father, as we move through Christmas and into the new year begin obediently, consistently, faithfully, loving others, beginning right here in our families, the church family, but then extending out to those that need to know the love of God personally through Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to be obedient, do what you say, when you say, just because you say, knowing that you loved us so much that you gave us life and light through Jesus Christ. Now let's stand together. Todd, what are you saying? 300 words are on the screen. You need to respond to Christ this morning, to accept him as Savior, to submit to him as Lord, to make some other decision this morning. You come as we sing. Number 300 on the screen without him. Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I should reflect. Without him, I would be free. Like a ship without. Yes, sir.
sermon of not love. But I want you to know I didn't do that this morning. I love you. And love's what it's all about. Love will make the difference. Paul said it's the greatest thing in the world. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. That's God's love. Given to us so that we can share it with others. That's what it's all about. Christmas. Hey, tonight, there will be things going on here for children and teenagers. We're going to bring them back. And then next Sunday, of course, no Sunday school, Christmas Day, you may have family things going on. You may not, but if you can be with us, be here at 1030. We'll have a morning service. It'll be sort of interactive. There'll be some scripture reading and some congregational singing, some special music. We celebrate the birth of Jesus. So if you come back, that'd be great. Father, dismiss us now. We thank you so much for the time we've had here this morning. We pray that you just bless the rest of our day. I pray for those, we have many families that are doing Christmas today and different things going on, Christmas activities with kids and grandkids and different things like that. I pray that you bless our church families that's away doing other things. Remind them again of the great love that you have for us and help us to demonstrate that love. We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.